proud that monasticism would draw, not uh, climate change. So welcome. Um, mention a couple of events. There's one very special event that is not on the public calendar, but we have been trying to get word out about. It's tomorrow at 4 o'clock. Um, it's an event marking the 25th anniversary of the Chernobyl catastrophe featuring uh, Natalia Moronova, who's founder of the Movement for Nuclear Safety in Chelyabinsk, and Natalia Mansurova, who's a radiation e ecology s expert for Planet of Hope in Chelyabinsk. Um, when we set this up, we didn't realize how timely a Chernobyl event would be, unfortunately, but um, it's from 4 to 5.30 tomorrow. Then on uh, Monday, April 4th, Melissa Stockdale, a fellow here from the University of Oklahoma, will be speaking about her work on patriotism and national identity in Russia's Great War, 1914 to 1918. On April 11th at noon, an event that might be of interest to some of, uh, of you, Andre Malayev Babel from Florida State, who's a theater person, will be speaking about Stanislavsky versus Vakhtanga. Reconciling the Russian the Theatrical Avant-Garde with Russian Orthodoxy. Um, so that will be on the 11th at noon. The 12th at 3.30, uh, the former Austrian ambassador to the Russian Federation, uh, Franz Seda, will be speaking about NATO, the EU, and Russia. So we have quite a bit uh, coming up. Uh, I will mention, um, if there is a government shutdown, uh, the Wilson Center will partially shut down, but not completely. So some of us will be missing, uh, but the, set, the program will go on. Uh, so let's hope we don't have to deal with that. But um, the news over this weekend wasn't good, so uh, we should keep that in mind. Um, well, this is a great book by a former scholar, and it's good to have Scott come back, and it's an honor to be associated with this book. Um, uh, it is unfortunately expensive, we've talked about that, but it is, for, for those of you uh, with a serious interest in Russia, it's, it's worth trying to have a serious look at and spend some time with. Uh, Scott is, um, uh, is a returning scholar. He was here uh, working on this project a while back. He has his PhD from Brandeis. Uh, you're a student of Greg Friese's. So, um, that w which will mean something to so some of you. Um, uh, and um, he also has a master's from UC Santa Barbara and from St. Vladimir's Orthodox Theological Seminary. He taught in Romania. Uh, he's been at, the, at Miami University in Oxford, Ohio for some time. Uh, and uh, he, he's written a number of articles. He's had a number of prestigious grants, including the one with us. And Scott, welcome back. Thank you. Uh, and I would certainly like to uh, thank the Cannon Institute um, for the possibility to be here while I was working on the book, uh, in addition to uh, having the time uh, to you know, work on it uh, uh, without distraction, um, and the great resources in Washington, the Library of Congress, and, and everything here, uh, the, the community of the, of the Cannon Institute proved critical, some of, you know, the smaller discussions we had uh, where I had an opportunity to present what I was working on um, came at a really critical stage when I was rethinking how to organize the, the project and, uh, and the people here made a very important uh, contribution to that, so I really am grateful for that. <coughs> so there were several things that attracted my attention to the study of monasticism in modern Russia. Uh, my take on modern Russia is a long period of time, right? So um, 19th and 20th centuries. Um, one was statistics. So part of Catherine the Great's reform, which secularized monastic estates in 1764, included great restrictions on monasticism, including eliminating 60% of the monasteries uh, in the Russian Empire, uh, as well as cutting back drastically the number of monks and nuns. This was followed by some half century of stagnation but beginning in the era of Nicholas I, monasticism began to recover. And that recover, recovery would continue to increase right up until the cataclysms of war and revolution in 1914 to 1917. The number of monasteries continually rose, 
during that period, surpassing the pre-secularization levels. So there were over a thousand monasteries in Russia in 1914. Uh, <clears throat> the beginning of the 19th century, there were some five or six thousand monks and nuns in the Russian Empire. And by 1914, there were almost 95,000 monks, nuns, and novices in the empire. So obviously a very dramatic increase, uh, which was uh, a substantial increase even um, in comparison to the rate of population growth. Uh, but statistics did not tell the whole story. Uh, we now know that there was a veritable explosion of pilgrimage in the 19th century, especially in the second half of the century. And the majority of Russian pilgrims stayed within the empire and most of them went to monasteries. That was the destination for this pilgrimage. Moreover, Russian Orthodoxy in general and monasticism in particular began to feature more prominently and more positively in Russian high culture, especially in the latter part of the century. Again, with you know, Gogol, Dostoevsky, Tolstoy, uh, the Slavophile Ivan Kireyevsky, the philosopher Vladimir Solovyov, all made their pilgrimages, especially to the Uptsina uh, hermitage. Uh, Mikhail Nesterov painted these idyllic scenes of serene monks and nuns. Chekhov drew uh, one of his most beautiful portraits of the artistic endeavor in his depiction of the monk poet uh, in Svetoyo Nochi, or Easter Eve is usually how it's translated. But no doubt, the, no doubt the greatest example is Dostoevsky's Brothers Karamazov, in which the monastery is not only the scene of, of significant portion of the action of the novel, but the monastery's elder, Zosima, <coughs> is a major figure, and it was through Zosima that Dostoevsky attempted to give his kind of positive Christian response to Ivan Karamazov's atheism. And it's hard to imagine something like the Brothers Karamazov or any of this role of Russian Orthodoxy and of monasticism happening even a half a century earlier. Something had happened in Russian culture. Um, uh, and by the early 20th century, monasticism came to epitomize orthodoxy in so many ways in both the minds of common believers and elites, both adherents and opponents. Uh, even this was particularly true of the Bolsheviks, uh, for whom monasteries uh, represent, were so symbolic of Russian orthodoxy that they became the first targets uh, of the anti-religious campaign. So why monasticism? Uh, to the modern Western mind, it seems like such a relic of the medieval past something so incongruent with modernity. Uh, indeed, in the West, Protestant countries uh, more or less did away with monasticism in the 16th century, mainly for uh, theological reasons, but in the case of England, of course, for uh, more, more mundane reasons as well. In Catholic lands, the Habsburgs were also cracking down on monasticism at vir virtually the same time, although with less intensity than Catherine the Great, while the French Revolution uh, entirely suppressed monasticism, not only in France, but also in the lands conquered by the French army under Napoleon. Although there was some recovery uh, in the 19th century in places like France, this revival was restricted primarily to female monasticism and particularly to those orders which could demonstrate some utility in providing social services such as education and health care. And this latter phenomenon was also part of the Russian story um, where the, uh, by the end of the century, um, a sig the majority of these new monastic recruits were actually women, um, and many of them were engaged in these kind of social services. But that's not the whole story. Russia also experienced a significant revival of traditional contemplative monasticism, particularly for men, and this was something unparalleled in Europe. Uh, if the European case of secularization and decline of religion were normative, which few still hold anymore, uh, or if Russia had continued to follow a European model of modernization as it seemed to be doing after Peter the Great, uh, if with a bit of lag, um, uh, it would seem, and this seemed to be the, what was happening in the 18th century as well as in terms of the role, social role of orthodoxy and monasticism and so on, um, this kind of revival was not what one would have expected. While the Soviets did their best to eliminate Russian Orthodoxy in general and monasticism in particular, in fact, both outlived the Bolshevik ideology and system. When Gorbachev took office in 1985, there were fewer than 20 monasteries left in the Soviet Union. In 2010, the Russian Orthodox Church officially reported that they have 788 monasteries now functioning. 
in the Russian Orthodox Church, not just in Russia, of course, but also Ukraine and Moldova. Um, moreover, the type of spiritual practice revived in 19th century Russia, the contemplative spirituality known as hesychasm, involving meditative practices such as the use of the Jesus prayer to still the mind in order to commune with God, and also involving the guidance of an experienced spiritual elder or starets, were contested and frequently viewed as innovations when they were first being revived in the 19th century. But by the end of the century, they were viewed as normative within Russia and were promoted throughout the Orthodox world in the 20th century. Uh, and so you pick up any introductory book on Orthodoxy, like whatever, Timothy Ware or something like this, this approach to spirituality is still presented as somehow normative, uh, or at least the, the quintessential Orthodox spiritual approach. Um, Russian Orthodoxy was, in fact, quite diverse a century ago, and with the collapse of communism, Orthodox believers and clergy are looking to the pre-revolutionary period to recover Orthodox traditions, um, but there are many different tendencies that they could be drawing upon, but certainly this monastic spiritual uh, model that I discuss in the book is one of the, one, one of the major ones that's being embraced today. So that understanding this historical context is critical to understanding what is happening today in the Russian Orthodox Church. Once again, I come to the question of why monasticism, since it is something alien to the modern world. Um, so just to say a few words in general, monasticism uh, emerged in the early church, of course, late third, early fourth century, gained momentum, especially after the conversion of Constantine, uh, when there was no more martyrdom, but perhaps the opposite threat, that is, too great um, union with the world and its value. So in this context, monasticism, which signaled a total dedication to the gospel, uh, meant surrendering the pursuits of the world, such as wealth, power, and family. Uh, since its inception, monasticism has been a central expression of Eastern Christianity, as it was, of course, in medieval Christianity in the West as well. Uh, the monks and nuns replaced the martyrs as heroes and heroines of the faith, the Christians who are willing to give up their lives, uh, even if not in literal senses as the martyrs, but in figurative uh, sense uh, for Christ. All right. With over a thousand monasteries and nearly a hundred thousand monks and nuns uh, in the Russian Empire by 1914, the subject of Russian monasticism in the modern period is an enormous one and one that has yet uh, receive virtually uh, no attention either by Russian scholars or Western scholars. The question, as I began, was how to tackle such an enormous subject. And the method I chose was to write essentially a microhistory focused on one collective of monasteries surrounding the most famous cloister in, in Russia, the Trinity St. Sergius Lavra, or Troitsa Sergeyev Lavra, uh, in Sergeyev Basad, or formerly Zagorsk, uh, about an hour and a half distance from Moscow. Founded in the 14th century by uh, Sergei Radonyersky, perhaps Muscovy's most beloved saint, the spiritual rebirth inspired by Sergei in the monastery he founded coincided with the emergence of Mos Muscovy from Mongol domination. Thereafter, the position and status of the monastery was inseparably connected with Moscow, and it emerged as Muscovy's <coughs> foremost monastery. It was an enormous landover, landowner by the time of Catherine the Great's secularization reform and therefore suffered tremendously in economic terms. Yet the veneration of St. Sergius continued unabated in the 19th century, and therefore the monastery retained and even expanded its preeminent status, making it perhaps the most important pilgrimage destination in the 19th century. Although Trinity Sergius itself was a large and famous monastery, and therefore always full of pilgrims and visitors, the 19th century it also sponsored the creation of smaller hermitages sort of in the sphere, in the vicinity of the, of the Lavra for the pursuit of contemplative monasticism that allowed for greater seclusion and quiet. Thus, by focusing on Trinity Sergis and this collective of, of communities surrounding it, I was able to examine monasticism in a variety of different settings, as well as the rich evidence of the interaction between the monastery and the people. Moreover, because of its status, so much so that even the Bolsheviks sought to preserve the monastery, not obviously as a functioning monastery, but as a historical monument, that its enormously rich archive, which consists of uh, 25,000 files um, from the 18th century to the closure of the monastery in 1920, 
um, <clears throat> was preserved intact uh, and serves, you know, this rich archive served as the fundamental source of the book, which was supplemented also by archival materials from the Holy Synod of the Russian Orthodox Church in St. Petersburg, um, which, from which I drew a general collect, you know, understanding of monasticism and how Trinity Surges fit into that larger context, uh, and also other archival and published sources such as letters, memoirs, and contemporary biographies of leading religious leaders, uh, also spiritual literature, pilgrimage accounts, and other sources. Um, so after an introduction, that's the uh, Trinity Cathedral from turn of the century depiction there. Also, uh, older picture of the monastery. Um, <coughs> so the, the, the book is roughly divided evenly between coverage of the 19th century and the 20th century. Um, and the key figure uh, in the 19th century uh, is Metropolitan Filaret Drazov of Moscow, no doubt the most important 19th century Russian hierarch who still awaits his biographer, by the way. <coughs> Filaret was a central figure in the 19th century awakening of orthodoxy that coincided with an upsurge of Russian national identity in the aftermath of, of the Napoleonic invasions, seeking what was distinctive to orthodoxy in distinction from Western models that had dominated in the 18th century and continued to dominate Russian theological education even in the first half of the 19th century. The recovery of the Greek church fathers, the revival of hesychastic spirituality, and the resurgence of monasticism can all be seen as parts of this larger process of the awakening of orthodoxy, and Filaret was central in promoting all of these areas. Since the 18th century, the Metropolitan of Moscow was appointed the abbot or superior of Trinity Sergius, but since obviously uh, as a busy bishop he could not functionally serve as the abbot, they have, he appointed a deputy uh, in Russian, namestnik, which I translate prior, um, to actually uh, serve functionally as the abbot of the monastery. One of the most important things Filaret did with regard to Trinity Sergius was to turn the office of the prior of the monastery into a position that was the culmination of a distinguished monastic career rather than a stepping stone in, a, in an ecclesiastical career that might end up in becoming a bishop or something like this. So that there were only five priors in the period between 1831 and 1919 of which uh, two were actually born serfs, um, and only one was, uh, was actually a, an aristocrat by background. Uh, of particular importance uh, in this regard was Filaret's choice of Antoni uh, Medvedev, who would serve as prior for 40, over 45 years, between 1831 and 1877. Uh, Filaret and Antoni are central figures uh, for several chapters of the book. Antoni, who was really responsible, for, as I said, for the day-to-day -day op operations and spiritual leadership of the community, was truly a remarkable figure uh, who developed virtually every aspect of the life of the monastery. So I'll, I'll start with a report uh, to the Holy Synod in 1863 that Filaret summed up Antoni's contributions after 30-some-odd years as prior. Quote, in the course of this time, the number of brothers of the monastery has more than doubled. The Gethsemane skeet was constructed and took shape and flourished far above expectation. This evident success took place because of the good example that Archimandrite Antoni provides of the monastic life and his tireless zeal for liturgical services. His careful administration and fundamental spiritual leadership attracted those who desired such leadership, both in the Lavra and in Gethsemane skeet. The increase in and the number of people demanded the strengthening of the means for their support. The careful attention and economic art of Archimandrite Antoni brought about a significant strengthening of the material means for the maintenance of the Lavra and the support of the brothers. Under his care were founded and by his care are maintained in the Lavra a populous school for children of the common people, of whom more than 180 enjoy the support of the Lavra and a school of iconography. Apart from the usual hospital for elderly monks, Two hospitals have been built and received support. Inside the monastery, a men's one for men, and outside the Lavra, in the home for the poor, a hospital for women, uh, for poor local women as well as for visitors. Under the leadership of Archimandrite Tintoni, a significant number of monastics were formed, some of whom be have become abbots of monasteries in various dioceses, and others uh, with great merit have entered missionary service." End quote. So just to unpack a few of these things, um, 
because of the restrictions imposed by the state through the Holy Synod, and also for financial reasons, monasteries in the beginning of the 20th century uh, were restricted in the number of monks that they could allow to join. Uh, and so there was this kind of conservatism that Antoni worked against to, as, as this document says, more than double the number uh, of the monks within the monastery itself. Uh, also, in order to support them, he had to uh, transform the monastery's economy, which had been devastated, as I said, by the confiscation of the monastery's estates by Catherine the Great. And in the course of the 19th century, the major point of this transformation, sort of finding a new basis for support, was that it fell upon, uh, upon the supporters of the monastery. Uh, and for such an, a large monastery with so many institutions it was operating, it had a quite enormous budget. And I was fascinated to discover that the single most important source of income for this enormous budget was the candle, <laughs> the sale of candles to ordinary pilgrims that they would light in the churches. Um, but Trinity Sergius did not use this f expanding financial resources only for itself, uh, as was frequently the charge of uh, intelligentsia critics, but rather the monastery also dramatically expanded its philanthropic activities under Antony. In the 1830s, they established the first school for boys of, you know, of sort of lower classes, which was also connected with an orphanage. Uh, as that document says, they built uh, hospitals, hostels to offer free shelter for pilgrims, uh, almshouses for the elderly poor, and this home for the poor that was established uh, by the monastery in Sergei Fassad uh, for women, uh, served women, in, uh, included a hospital, a hostel, uh, an almshouse, uh, and in the 1860s, Antoni established the first school for girls, uh, as well as an orphanage for girls in Sergei Fassad, uh, which was actually somewhat of a controversial uh, uh, move on his part, but at any rate. Um, and this was not only Antoni who, who did this, but his successors continued these, um, these efforts as well. In fact, in this one picture, uh, the building that's kind of on the left side of the picture above the head of the man who is walking down the street, um, today it's actually the post office in Sergei Fassad if you ever visit, but that was in the 1890s uh, was built as a hostel uh, to house hundreds of you know, pilgrims who, who would be visiting the monastery for free of charge. Um, uh, one of uh, Anto Antoni and Filaret's major contributions was the establishment of Gethsemane Skeet, or Gethsemansky Skeet, uh, also in, in Sergei Fassad, a, a few kilometers away from uh, the Lavra itself, which was supposed to be a place of retreat and quiet. Uh, and when they established it in the 1840s, uh, Filaret says in one of his letters to Antonio, I wonder if we can even find a few people who will be interested in this project, because it required you know, solitude, isolation, a stricter monastic rule. Uh, and within a decade, uh, the skeet numbered 120 monks. So it, uh, it did meet the kind of response um, that uh, far exceeded their expectations even. Um, and so this was really the center of the revival of contemplative spirituality, or hesychasm, uh, and also the place where uh, the tradition of spiritual elders took root. And we're probably, maybe some of you are more familiar with Optina, the case of Optina Pustin, the one that uh, is, is kind of probably the basis for what's reflected in Brothers Karamazov and so on. Um, and while Gethsemane is, is not as uh, famous as Optina, perhaps, uh, it, wa it served pretty much the same kind of function uh, in the 19th century. Um, and by the end of the century, there's a, there was a uh, filial um, that was established that had this famous elder, Varnava, as well as what was considered a miracle working icon, so that the visiting the uh, Chernigov Caves part of the Gethsemane Skeet um, was pretty much a requisite part of any pilgrimage to Trinity Sergis itself uh, in the 19th, late 19th century. Um, so in uh, the, the sort of substance of the book is divided into to eight chapters. So in the first two chapters, I look at, at Trinity Surges specifically, and then the story of Gethsemane Skeet, um, especially during, you know, under Filaret and Antoni. Then the next chapter I look at, uh, I attempted, first of all, to attempt uh, to ascertain the social profile of monastic recruits. Uh, which changed quite substantially over the course of the 19th century, but by the end of the 19th century reflected rather what one would expect of Russian society itself. That is, the vast majority were coming from the peasantry. 
um, but was still, you know, drawing recruits from other classes, although very few from the aristocracy. But I would say that this, we shouldn't conclude from this that the aristocracy was thereby uh, alienated from monasticism, because they figure quite prominently um, both in pilgrim narratives as well as um, the, the um, you know, those who gave donations to build buildings uh, like this uh, when depicted here. Um, also, I, I looked at, uh, tried to attempt to analyze um, the ideals as well as the realities of monastic life, both by looking at uh, normative spiritual texts as well as documents uh, that revealed uh, monks who uh, transgressed the, the boundaries of mona monastic rules. Uh, and just say that the uh, greatest sin against which the monastery had to struggle uh, was not sex, as one might think, you know, with uh, their vow of celibacy, but being Russia, it was drunkenness. Um, in addition to uh, the internal life of the monastery, I saw the monastery as a locus of interaction with society as well and as, a, and, and as the destination for pilgrimage. Um, and I estimate, based upon various data, that uh, Around the year 1860, there were some 250,000 pilgrims who went to Trinity Sergis every year, uh, and this clearly more than doubled by 1900. Um, come back to the, yeah? No, no, all from Russia, or mo the vast majority were from Russia, certainly, yeah. Uh, there were, I don't know, there are some evidence of foreign visitors as well, but in the 19th century, they were predominantly Russian. But from all over Russia. No, they were Russian Orthodox. Sure. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, but probably, you know, the best I can estimate is definitely over 600,000 pilgrims a year um, by uh, the turn of the century. Uh, so, by contrast with Western Europe, where the forces of modernization, um, such as greater mobility, uh, and literacy uh, actually in Russia fed popular religiosity rather than detracted from it. So I analyze also pilgrim narratives, which usually contain some kind of miracle stories, miracle healings um, that focused on the relics of the, oh, there you have the front with pilgrims gathering in the front. The, this is the reliquary of St. Sergius, um, which was uh, uh, sort of the, the focus around which the pilgrim narratives are told. And by looking at the archives, you can actually see the first-hand accounts by the pilgrims themselves rather than sort of how they're filtered through, through the lens of the clergy. And here I would just um, mention that, um, <coughs> you know, of the cases at least connected with Trinity Sergius, that pilgrim, pilgrims were both men and women and of all social classes from uh, the aristocracy to the peasantry and, and in between as well. And the miraculous was not seen in these narratives as in conflict with modernity or science or medicine. Uh, and in fact, most of those who claim they received some, can you wait till the end and then come back to the questions? Um, uh, received, uh, who, who claim they received miraculous cures um, had visited doctors first, and in a sense, you know, there wasn't a tension there or a conflict there, but somehow the, the saint could intervene where, uh, where medicine uh, had, you know, when it surpassed the capacity of medicine to, uh, to fix the problem. Um, turning to the, to the portions of the book that deal with the 20th century, uh, I have two chapters that deal with uh, the period before 1917, one that focuses on efforts to, um, to reform and revitalize monastic life. In a sense, they, they, the very success of monasticism seemed to uh, threaten a decline in the quality of monastic life with so many recruits, especially um, coming from the peasantry with less education and so on. Uh, and then also I look at the monastery's political uh, involvement uh, during the you know, events uh, from the revolution of 1905 through the February Revolution of 1917 and also the sort of political discourse that the monastery uh, was engaged in. And then finally there are two chapters dealing with the Soviet period, one um, dealing um, extensively with just the period of the revolution itself, so from uh, October 1917 through about 1921, where the monastery was closed uh, eventually in 1919. Uh, it was transformed into a monastery, the decree to, uh, into, a, into a museum, and the de decree to turn it into a museum was signed by 
uh, Lenin himself. Um, but curiously, they staffed this museum with many religious intellectuals, uh, including, uh, in the depiction here, the figure in the white is Pavel Florensky, perhaps one of the most brilliant uh, religious thinkers of the 20th century, uh, who served in the, in the uh, museum um, uh, of the, the former Trinity Sergius Lavra, uh, beginning in, in 1918, 1919. Um, but there was also uh, an assault on religious belief, uh, especially uh, the, the Soviets had a campaign of trying to uh, undermine popular belief by um, debunking the faith in, in relics of saints. So you here actually have a picture of them opening up the reliquary of St. Sergius and seeing, and basically saying, see, it's, it's just a skeleton, as if that was going to uh, um, undermine people's faith. In fact, the, the reaction was quite the opposite. People were upset that the Bolsheviks were uh, uh, invading their faith uh, and so on. All right, while the, the uh, communists closed major monasteries, as I said, they were one of the first targets of the anti-religious campaign, especially in 1919, uh, some of the smaller um, agricult com smaller communities in the countryside, they left alone so long as they, they transformed themselves voluntarily into agricultural collectives, uh, which many of them did. Uh, so for example, Gethsemane Skeet uh, transformed itself into, a, uh, into a, an agricultural collective and, and survived that way until 1928. Uh, and some of the others did as well, and they continued to receive pilgrimages and be kind of centers of uh, a spiritual uh, nourishment, as it were. So, uh, in a sense, the impression I get from the 1920s is that the the Soviets were losing the the, the anti-religious campaign, uh, which is probably part of what fed into the the great turn that comes, of course, under Stalin. Uh, from you know, 19 between 1928 and 1930, all of the remaining monastic communities uh, in the entire you know Soviet Union are closed, uh, and also beginning with that time period, many of the monks themselves are targeted in the de-Kulakization campaign and sent to the gulag, um, and so on. And throughout the 30s, there's, there's a fairly consistent persecution where, where monks, uh, um, and to a lesser extent nuns, are arrested and sent to the gulag. Um, and then it reaches, it's called, this is um, the former, the last prior of Trinity Sergius, as well as one of the most famous elders um, in, in the picture there on the left is uh, Kranid is the last prior, and then Alexei was this elder. So these are pictures from the 1920s. Um, but uh, in 1937 uh, and 1938, basically during the terror, all of the remaining monks that were still sort of at large um, were rounded up and systematically and executed. So Kranid, this the one who was in the previous pictures, was arrested and. November 1937 uh, and executed at Butova in, uh, in December 1937 along with uh, 10 other uh, monks and then more of them were, were rounded up uh, in uh, early 1938. You see there also the icon, he's been canonized, he was canonized I think in 2000 as, a, as one of the new martyrs. Um, and I have, I discuss in, in the book uh, quite extensively from the records from the actual interrogation, the NKVD interrogations of Kranid and you have his uh, responses and everything, which I can talk more about if, if anybody's interested. But basically, they were arrested. Uh, what they were accused of was anti-Soviet propaganda um, and, uh, and also counter-revolutionary activity. And the, the latter was because they were supposedly continuing the existence of the monastery secretly. Um, uh, and the, the anti-Soviet anti propaganda was because they had discussed among themselves and people who are still visiting them the, the you know, religious persecution uh, that was taking place in the Soviet Union uh, and so on. Okay, uh, Trinity Surge, so it was closed in 1919, 1920. Uh, it was closed for 25 years, but then was reopened. It was the one monastery in the Russian Federation that was allowed to reopen uh, as a result of the kind of change of course uh, during World War II, so it was reopened in 1946, and of course remained an extremely important destination. All the foreign tourists were taken there, and and so on uh, during the Soviet period. Uh, so I, I, you know, explore that uh, the Soviet period a little bit there, uh, and then of course with in the collapse of the Soviet Union, as I mentioned, there's been quite an enormous 
uh, resurgence once again of monasticism in post-Soviet Russia, and Trinity Surges still to this day, of course, is a, is a major destination both of tourism uh, and of pilgrimage. But there are many different ways in which this, this story of the 19th century uh, and early 20th century has been sort of made central or normative for the contemporary Russian Orthodox Church, in part through the canonization of spiritual leaders, people like that Varnava that I, that I mentioned, one of the famous elders, both Filaret and Antoni have been canonized, uh, many others, as well as the, the, the new martyrs like, uh, like Kranigius, all the icon and so on. Uh, and this place, Butova, where they were, were executed outside of Moscow, sort of killing fields um, where enormous, uh, you know, tens of thousands of people were executed there. Um, and with scholars, with all the literature on the terror, almost nobody has paid attention to the persecution for religious reasons. And I, as I remember calculating the statistics, probably w one out of 20 people who was executed at Butova wa was done so specifically for religious reasons, not just Russian Orthodox, although they were the majority. So it's a major component of, of, uh, of the terror that has, has sin uh, so far been uh, not paid attention to. And whereas most attempts at places like uh, organizations like Memorial to draw closer attention to the, to the, you know, the terror and so on have not met with much positive response, uh, the church's effort at Butova has uh, been rather successful as a, as a monument to the terror. So you have a um, picture here, and this is the wall of the names of, of uh, the victims and so on. Um, so I'll end with that. Okay, thank you. Um, I think there were questions, so we'll open it right up. Um, okay, let me get hands. Uh, we're going to start with Steve. I, we'll go around because it'll be easier with the microphone. So we'll start with Steve, and we'll we'll move down. R right, right here. Wonderful presentation. Nice, simple question. I saw Butovskaya Polygon. I'm not familiar. My Russian is a little rusty. What mm -hmm. does Polygon mean? Uh, it, it's a shooting range, firing range. Yeah. So it, it literally was before um, uh, was a practice place. It belonged to the NKVD, and it was where they would practice shooting. But then, uh, you know, they sort of took the shooting to a new level and, uh, during the terror. So. James? Thank you very much. Um, I know this is probably a pretty minor part of your work since you do 19th and uh, 20th century, but you mentioned right at the beginning that uh, Catherine had really clamped down on pilgrimage and monasticism, or maybe just monasticism. And I was just wondering if you could elaborate a little bit on that. I mean, what, what, what she was trying to achieve mm. by, by cutting down on monasticism. Thank you. Okay, sure. Um, I, I don't know so much about the uh, uh, pilgrimage per se, but monasticism definitely, and this was something that began with Peter the Great actually, uh, and part of it was this sense among kind of the 18th century enlightened rulers of Russia that monasticism was, you know, the, s these people were socially useless, they didn't contribute anything to society, they weren't, you know, um, contributing anything to the economy or fighting in the army or, you know, nuns weren't bearing children, you know, these were the things that, that especially Peter wanted people to be doing in the kind of state that he was trying to build. Uh, and so Peter uh, was the first one to, to start uh, placing restrictions on, on the number of monasteries and the number of monks joining, monks and nuns who could join um, and restricted the establishment of new monasteries. Um, and then this was con this policy was continued by his successors, but it really reached a culmination with Catherine the Great, um, probably partially simply for for economic reasons that she, you know, they were uh, quite some, uh, especially the most famous monasteries were enormous landowners, and by she literally just confiscated their estates and then distributed them to you know Patyomkin and other of her favorites and this kind of thing. Um, but, uh, but part of the story is that by in taking away their, their estates, she promised to give them a, a sort of meager state budget to support the monks and the nuns. And each monastery was given a specific class, which then stated how many monks or nuns could be in it and how much money they got. Uh, and because she didn't want to you know, give too much money, this was part of the motivation for closing a lot of the monasteries. Uh, and because of this sort of restrictions on the number of people and the, and the amount of money each community could get, this sort of had a long-term effect of deterring more people from, 
being accepted into monastery. Awesome. Thanks, Scott. I've been waiting for this book for so long, and I'm really excited that uh, you've got it out. I have two questions. Um, I know that you're working not on a female monastery, but I wondered if you could talk a little bit about why there were so many more nuns than monks uh, at the turn of the 20th century. And then I wanted to ask you a question um, that came up during my own research on World War I. Um, monasteries were very active in um, providing uh, shelter for refugees and uh, medical services and premises and on and on and on. But I was really struck in the literature by how many complaints there were that their monasteries were not doing enough for the war effort. And it wasn't just the left-wing press, it was also the right-wing press. And that suggested that there was a certain current of hostility towards at least the big and wealthy monasteries. And I wondered if you had um, any feeling about a tension in society towards their, their views towards these monasteries and the wealth some of them commanded. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so on the first question about uh, the numbers of women, this is a fascinating story, and there are a couple of people working on it. Uh, um, Bill Wagner at Williams College has, has been writing on, on, on that. Um, and, uh, and it's interesting that, that sort of uh, in the middle of the 19th century, there were sort of two monks to every nun or something like this. Uh, and by the end of the century, it's reversed, that kind of statistic. And it's really, especially from like the 1880s onwards, that the number of women just skyrockets, literally. Um, and there's probably a whole series of, of factors, you know, what's going on in the, in the village and overpopulation. And it's a, it's a way for women to choose um, a lifestyle that offers them all kinds of opportunities that, especially for peasant women, were not open to them, to get an education, to actually exercise authority, um, to be involved in, you know, service of society through healthcare and education and things like this. Uh, they often ran schools and whatnot. Um, uh, and, you know, sort of also just devoting themselves to, uh, um, you know, the, the religious life and things like that. So there's a whole sort of complex of reasons that, um, you know, I'm not uh, necessarily the best person to, to get into all of it, but it's, it's a fascinating question. So keep an eye out for, for Bill's work as he continues to produce it. Um, so the second question is a very interesting one, and I actually have an article uh, I did on World War I, monastery, the role of monasteries during World War I. And you're exactly right that they did quite a tremendous amount in terms of uh, um, offering shelter to refugees from the front, um, making donations, and, and Almost all monasteries established, um, um, I forget the term, but you know, basically hospitals for wounded soldiers and so on. But there was this this uh, attitude in society that you know among the sort of educated elites that monasteries w had grown too rich once again and therefore were corrupt and were just you know lazy and getting fat and living off the people's wealth and and this sort of thing. Um, and so there were calls by the latter part of the 19th century, especially in the early 20th century, for a second secularization and, and this kind of thing. Um, and you're right that this was not only in sort of uh, secular circles where people were maybe hostile to religion, but there was also a, a trend within the Russian Orthodox themselves to uh, that, that sort of sympathized with more of a another strain that was also in Russian Orthodoxy at the time, which was, uh, and sort of promoted, especially within parish clergy circles, that, that the church should enter into the world and you know, serve the people uh, and provide social services and, and this kind of thing. There's a nice book by uh, Jennifer Hedda, His Kingdom Come, I think is the title, where she discusses this whole kind of movement. And so people who sort of sympathize with that approach uh, also thought of monasteries and the sort of just the stereotype of what a monastery is as the withdrawal from the world as contradicting those kinds of aims. And so there was actually a very intense debate in religious journals in 1902 and 1903 where, where one sort of uh, lay Russian Orthodox writer said, monasteries don't really do what they're supposed to do and it's sort of outmoded and they're going to become obsolete, so why don't we just transform monasteries into... Uh, 
uh, institutions that, that do social services, basically. And, and this elicited a response from uh, a figure from Trinity Sergis, um, who defended the, the sort of traditional ideal of contemplative monasticism. But this debate, which raged for you know, two years in ecclesiastical journals, um, w was all done you know, within Russian Orthodox circles, right? There was no um, sort of anti-religious people who were involved in it, but it, it meant competing visions of what the church itself should do. Right? And we have about 10, 15 minutes, at least four people on this side. Is there anybody else on this side? Okay, Zhenya. Now in Russia, near 1,000 of monastery. And uh, uh, after orders of uh, Putin and Medvedev, uh, Russian Orthodox Church uh, became the most big owner uh, of uh, uh, immobility in Russia, maybe second after Russian state. Mm -hmm. And uh, what can you say? about uh, potential uh, resistance of uh, Russian church to social and political uh, changes and transformation in our society. We good now that uh, Russian Orthodox Church any time uh, was uh, very, uh, very resistant against uh, something uh, political transformation in our society. Okay, and before you answer, let's get, uh, uh, I think Susan was next, and then we'll come down here. So right over here, Susan, put your hand up to help. Oh, uh, did you had a question too? Oh, okay. <laughs> okay, Tom. Oh, okay, we'll take the question over there. And one question, uh, what can you say about uh, the continuation of monastery tradition, Russian monastery tradition, in Russian emigration in the 20th century? Because there were different tendencies. Uh, I studied this uh, problem in uh, French and in USA, for example. Yes, mm -hmm. thank you. Okay, well, why don't we take these two questions? Okay, well, in, in a sense, both of those questions are, are um, really outside the scope of what I was, you know, my research. Um, uh, as far as the first one, the, the contemporary situation is so complex in so many different ways, and there's so many <laughs> seemingly contradictory things going on that it's, uh, you know, I'm, I'm a little hesitant to even venture. You need to have Irina Popkova back here for, uh, to talk about the contemporary situation. Uh, it's certainly, I mean, one of the things that I'm curious about is clearly there is a revival of monasticism, and as I said, they, they claim 788 monasteries, and the Russian Orthodox Church today, um, but I don't. What they don't tell you is how many monks and nuns there are, and I have the impression that in many cases, you know, they they wanted to reclaim a former monastery, so they they got the property back from the state and they stick one or two monks in there and say they have a, a monastery. So it's it's very unclear about what's happening there, um, and as far as the relations with with the state and so on. There's a lot of different things going on in, even in different monastic circles. You have some that really are, I know that there are some who, you know, serve kinds of things of, you know, sort of try to help uh, drug rehabilitation and um, various kinds of, you know, they do try to serve social services and social functions in, in that kind of way. Um, Trinity Surges itself even has a, um, uh, a kind of, youth club for troubled youth that has this kind of quasi-religious, quasi-military dimension to it, which is kind of curious. Um, <coughs> but as far as, you know, sort of relations with the state, it's unclear whether, uh, whether the Russian Orthodox Church will sort of go the path of, you know, basically function as a, as a kind of quasi-state church, uh, or whether it will actually foster an opportunity for the development of civil society and kind of alternating voices in that. Um, as far as in the immigration, it's not something I've, I've really uh, studied um, to any great extent. Of course, you know, you have places like Jordanville and New York and things like this, um, where, uh, once again, there were different currents even within Russian monasticism, let alone within Russian orthodoxy at the time of the revolution. And these 
are in many ways sort of continued by what happens, and they become sort of more polarized in the Russian emigration. You have you know sort of the battles between um, the, the kind of the Paris school uh, of you know, the theological approach versus the more conservative ones of, of something like Jordanville and um, uh, and things like that. I will come back to the final two questions, but I since you, you um, your answer pointed in the direction of the question I had. Let me erase it now. Um, you talked about 600,000 pilgrims in 1914. That's a lot of people yeah. to be moving around. That's yeah. a large organizational capacity. And there is a debate, um, there's a discussion in um, historiography on Russia about how robust civil society was or wasn't uh, in the early 20th century. Um, to what extent do these 600,000 actually reflect on uh, the emergence of a civil society, or uh, are we really seeing uh, it, it was a relationship with the, the state too strong to talk in those terms? Uh, or, but w how would you fit monasticism into uh, the current discussion about the, the nature of Russian civil society in the beginning of the 20th century? All right, that's, I mean, there clearly was a level uh, within the church where they were resisting sort of the pressures from the state. Uh, and this actually begins, it, it becomes really clear by the end of the, of the century, you know, on the eve of the, of the revolution, but it's, it's there even with uh, somebody like Metropolitan Filaret. In fact, uh, the establishment of Gethsemane Skeet, uh, Filaret and Antoni kept that a secret. <laughs> for uh, a couple, for at least a decade, because they were afraid that the that the synod wouldn't allow them to do this. Um, so there was a level at which the sort of the holy synod is somewhat controlled, you know, sort of more directly under the the thumb of state interests. But there were lots of factors and and players who were resisting that and find trying to find alternative uh, ways of doing things um, throughout the 19th century. Of course, by the early 20th century, one of the things that happens is that after the 1905 revolution, the field gets really more polarized in so many ways. And so um, uh, some of the people, many of religious leaders sort of feel like they, they get pushed into taking this more vehemently anti-revolutionary kind of stance and therefore uh, sort of more pro-monarchy pro and things like that. And, sort of explicit ways than were necessarily the case before. But even within that, there's, there's so many different kinds of currents going on. And um, you know these pilgrims, of course, who are just traveling to the monastery from different places. But you know, the pilgrim narratives talk about how you know, people from all sorts of different parts of Russia, will, are, they're meeting together, and they're talking together, and they, they feel some sense of connection based upon what they're doing, a sort of collective endeavor. Um, and so you know, maybe there is some, some ways in which you have uh, alternative forms of, of identity being formed and so on. Okay, the final two questions, Thomas and the gentleman here. <coughs> My name's Thomas Grindley. This is a two-part question. Uh, first, the number of monasteries seems to have risen to about 1,000 in 1914 and then actually fell to zero during the uh, Soviet period, but then seems to have risen to about a 1,000 again. Could you explain the actual property transactions that took place? I presume that uh, the Soviets actually uh, took over the, the actual property, ownership of the property, uh, but then uh, if there's now a 1,000 mon monasteries, Presumably, uh, the Russian state uh, uh, returned the property to the actual Orthodox Church. That's the first question. The, sef the second question, it seems the growth of atheism, which seems to have reached the zenith in 1917, must be related in some way to the people's distaste for monasticism. monasticism. Could you explain this distaste, which permitted the people l letting the Soviets 
uh, 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 take over the monasteries, and then explain the recent reversal of this distaste. distaste. Presumably the people in Russia no longer have a distaste for monasteries or they wouldn't have let the 1,000 monasteries come back. And the final question right here. Uh, you mentioned the sort of hectic life of prelates and uh, monastic clergy like Metropolitan Filariet, who would of course have graduated from the theological academies and received tonsure then and then assumed some sort of administrative position in the church. They dominated the intellectual life of the church by serving as rectors in the seminaries and academies. And you also mentioned that n the majority of these new monks toward the end of the century were coming from the peasantry. So my question is, what kind of divide or how clear a divide, uh, social or otherwise, existed within the monastic clergy between those educated uh, clerics and, the, uh, and those who chose the contemplative life, those who, those who participated in the administration of the church in the sort of active, hectic life versus those who actually withdrew from the world? Mm -hmm. Pretty big question. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so I'll start with the last one first. Uh, and I would say there was uh, a s there was a divide, definitely, because uh, the, the typical career path for a bishop was somebody who was born uh, a son of a parish clergy, right? So since parish clergy marry in Russia, they would be born of parish clergy, they would go to the seminary, then they would go to the theological academies, and while at the theological academies, take monastic vows, uh, and then go off exactly as you said, become, you know, teachers at a seminary, then maybe rector of the seminary, uh, and then eventually be consecrated to the episcopate and then sort of follow this career path even within the episcopate. And so you could be a, bishops in the Russian Orthodox tradition are monks, but it's sort of, they are technically monks. You could be a bishop, in fact, almost all the bishops in 19th century Russia were monastics in as much as they were celibate and took monastic vows, but few of them had actually ever lived in monasteries, right? Uh, whereas the ordinary monks were coming from all social classes, uh, they didn't attend seminaries, uh, they simply joined monasteries, uh, and you know, only a small minority of them were even ordained to the priesthood. They were mostly lay in terms of a, a kind of ordained status. Um, so this, you know, this sort of tensions that are going on in the early 20th century and this sort of discourse about there needs to be reform and so on may be a kind of clash of world, even a clash of worlds even within the monastery between precisely the sort of more educated elites who come from clerical backgrounds versus the, the kind of ordinary monks who just, you know, come up through the ranks. Obviously there were crossover. Uh, so for example, as I mentioned, uh, out of the five priors of the Trinity Sergius Lava between 1830 and, and 1920, two of them were sons of parish clergy who had been to seminary and, and this kind of thing. Uh, one of them was an aristocrat, but two of them had been born as serfs. Antoni himself, who, that I discussed so, so much, was born as a serf. Uh, so you could also, as um, uh, as a peasant, then kind of rise up in the monastery hierarchy uh, and end up as an abbot of a major monastery. Um, th those kind of people never, to my knowledge, went on to become bishops, but they could uh, exercise quite a bit of authority within the monasteries themselves. So it's, uh, th there were sort of two different worlds, but it wasn't a, a sort of absolute divide. You know. Coming back to um, the other question, I wouldn't say that the zenith of Russian atheism was 1917. Uh, I would say that uh, Russian atheism uh, and you know, Bolshevism in 1917, as evidenced by the votes for the Constituent Assembly and so on, was really a minority opinion within Russia uh, at the time of the revolution. Bolsheviks simply were successful at, uh, at um, taking power for a whole variety of reasons, which you know, I won't get into here. Um, but uh, so, it's a, it's a complex picture of what's happening in 1917. 
Um, but what I discovered specifically by looking at Trinity Sergius is that in February, after the February Revolution, there is some tension between the monastery and the local population, and peasants in certain regions around the monastery are actually um, taking over the monastery's land to, you know, grow hay and, and these kinds of things um, against, obviously, the monastery's wishes and so on. And so while uh, between February and October of 1917, the, the evidence points to a certain tension um, between and uh, almost bordering on conflict between the monastery and the local population. But the reverse happens after uh, after the October Revolution, when the Bolsheviks are directly coming in and, and doing things like uh, exposing the relics of St. Sergius and so on, then the population responds in defense of the monastery. But, you know, what could they do? There, there was only so much that, uh, that they could do. I would say the, the zenith of atheism uh, in Russia only comes long after, well, it's hard to say, you know, but some, some point in the, uh, you know, post-World War II period, w just through the long process of the church no longer having much of a presence and through uh, education and, and things like that. But, you know, after uh, the Soviet ideology was, you know, sort of Russians come to the conclusion after 1991 that Soviet ideology was bankrupt, sort of searching for a new new sources of meaning and ways of approaching the world, Russian Orthodoxy is one alternative. Uh, and there were, you know, statistics at least uh, 10 years ago or whatever, what are the most trusted institutions in Russian society? And the church was, I uh, think, usually ranked number two or something like this. So um, so there is this, uh, I wouldn't say that the, there's necessarily a strong sense of conflict across the board. Um, I suspect that in most cases, as far as the, the property transfer, you're right that in many cases it's probably the vast majority of cases, it's the, mon it's the church reclaiming properties that it owned before 1917. Uh, and this is what is this large number of monasteries that exist in the Russian Orthodox Church today. Um, of course, in many cases, I mean, they were all taken over by the Soviet state. They were all declared national property. If it was a very important monastery, like Trinity Sergius, it was turned into a museum and therefore preserved in terms of the physical buildings of it, you know, the architecture and the property of the monastery, including, you know, the icons and all this sort of stuff. But uh, the majority of monasteries were, were sort of pillaged in terms of their property, um, and, you know, the buildings were turned into everything from, you know, storehouses to uh, theaters and, and cultural clubs. And, and in many cases, actually, uh, Khrushchev actually, of course, destroyed more physical churches even than Stalin did. So many of them uh, and, uh, were simply destroyed. But Scott, thank you. Susan, very quickly, we're out of time, so quickly. Okay, quickly. Uh, well, enormous amounts of wealth doesn't uh, stop the wealthy from wanting more, right? So, <laughs> um, no, she mostly confiscated it for the for the to distribute to those who are close to her, and you know that she wanted to sort of promote people like Petyonkin and so on. So. Scott, thank you. It's good to have you back. Very nice book. We're proud of it. Thanks. Thank you.